Welcome to the final episode of season one of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher Brown, and today we have a great guest for you. Since the launch of the show, I've been asked the same thing. Why are you doing this podcast? And I give everyone the exact same answer. This podcast is about talking to people in an intimate setting and just having a discussion. Today, we often find ourselves becoming keyboard warriors and have forgotten the lost art of the conversation. So with that in mind, in mid-2019, I started this podcast to achieve one goal, get people talking again. With no notes, no questions, I sit down with subjects to learn about them from them. And our final guest of the season is certainly no exception to that rule. Today, I am honored to have the Honorable Tony Clement on the show. Tony and I chat about his rise to provincial politics in Ontario under Premier Mike Harris and Premier Ernie Eves. We talk about his time in federal politics and that 2015 and 2019 election and what the Conservatives did wrong and how they can reclaim the government in the next election. So with that in mind, please enjoy Enjoy the season finale of Cross Border Interviews featuring Tony Clement. Uh, so, first off, do you mind if I tell, call you Tony or do you prefer Mr. Sure. Clement? No, Tony's fine. Yeah. T- Tony's fine. Okay. Uh, Tony, greatly appreciate it for you uh, sitting down today and doing this. Uh, uh, I won't keep uh, your time. Uh, I'll keep this as short and simple as possible because you probably have other things that you need to get to. But you said it is snowing, so we'll try and make it as warm as possible for you. <laughs> for sure. I appreciate it. So, um Usually I start with every politician I sit down with, former politician, politician, or candidate to be a politician, and ask the same question to start this off. Where did your sense of duty come from? Oh, um, (laughs) well, a couple of things. I guess I wanted to change the world, don't we all? Uh, And uh, that combined with um, my stepfather, who who was a member of provincial parliament in Ontario, former cabinet minister under Bill Davis, and um, uh, the, the combination of those two things, and I think the times as well. I, I sort of came of age in the 70s, and uh, there was a lot going on. The Vietnam War was ending, Watergate was happening. In Canada, we had uh, this guy named Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, who was uh, bringing us uh, closer to socialism every day. So uh, you, you react to the thing that is there. So uh, in the 60s, people reacted to the establishment. In the 70s, the establishment was very statist. It was very uh, intrusive into people's lives and choices. And that's what I reacted to. And at the same time, you started to get these successful politicians come come around. Uh, they, they came to their fore in the 80s, like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher, that showed that you can be conservative and be elected at the same time. And especially in the 80s, because uh, you don't traditionally think that someone uh, like Ronald Reagan or uh, Margaret Thatcher or even here in Canada, Brian Mulroney, would be elected after electing someone like Pierre Trudeau. You think they would go with someone a little bit more softer. But there was a pendulum swing in the 80s where it went from one side to another. And your story sort of starts in the 80s with your university days of getting involved locally in Ontario in the Ontario Provincial Conservatives, correct? Yeah, I was very active on campus uh, when I was an undergrad and in law school, both on campus and doing things off campus whilst being a student. So on campus, I became president of my college. I was on was elected to the Board of Governors, the Governing Council of the University of Toronto. So I did that kind of stint, uh, student politico, if you were. And off campus at the same time, yes, I was very involved in uh, the both the provincial conservative the PC Party of Ontario and the federal conservatives at the time. And, uh, you know, we there were changes of leaders and uh, I got very active uh, supporting Brian Mulroney when he ran for leader in 1983 and uh, then supporting Larry Grossman when he ran for leader in 1985 provincially in Ontario. So, uh, so 1985, so that was the... Who won that leadership? Was it Grossman or no? Well, there were two leaderships in the same year, so <laughs> not, not 
not a great time for the Ontario PCs, but uh, the first time uh, Frank Miller won yeah. and then uh, became premier and then unfortunately uh, lost the premiership to David Peterson. And Bob Ray. Uh, the com- and Bob Ray. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The combined, uh, they combined forces. And then it, yeah, after that happened, there was another leadership, which Grossman won. Okay. Um when did your introduction to Mike Harris come about? Because I was trying to do research on you, and I, I know you were close to him during the 90s uh, when you were the Ontario president, but there was no introduction. So when was your first introduction to Mike Harris, the then uh, leader of the Ontario Progressive Conservatives? Well, it really happened as a result of the uh, 1990 leaders, leadership race. Okay. I was, was uh, basically... Uh, Actually, before 1989, I think it was, we uh, changed the constitution of the party. Uh, I was the the one who spearheaded that so that it was one member, one vote. It was the first time every member could have a vote in the leadership selection outside of French Canada, outside of the province of Quebec. Uh, So we kind of led the way on that. And then I became the chief elections officer for that process that elected Mike Harris as leader of the party. Uh, He then uh, ran the campaign of 1990 law and then I became president of the Ontario PC party in 1990 so he and I worked very uh, closely together while he was the leader of the third party not even leader of the opposition and then in 92 when my term was over he hired me it was the first and only time I've been I've been a staffer and he hired me to be the assistant principal secretary uh, uh, in his office kind of the second in command is as if you will Uh, and um uh, that uh, led to my being very involved with him day in, day out to plan for the next election, uh, including candidate recruitment and the by-election processes and so on. Then uh, I like to say it's like that uh, that Remington Shaver commercial, you know, where the guy, you know, he liked, liked the shaver so much he bought the company. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, you know, I like, you know, helping to find candidates for us so much I became a candidate myself and uh, in the 1995 election was nominated in Brampton South to be our candidate and that was the common sense revolution election which saw Mike Harris go from third place to first place and be the next premier of Ontario and uh, the rest as they say is history. So about that 1995 election um, Mm -hmm. polls were not in the favor of Mike Harris during that time because you you had a, a Democratic elected uh, president down south. The Liberals were in majority territory in uh, on ta- in Canada. Uh, the Liberals in Ontario were looking like they were going to be the next leader, uh, next uh, a potential government. But how did how did you and uh, how did Mike Harris and through him yourself and all the candidates win over Ontarians with that common sense revolution? Because some people out out here in Alberta might not understand what that common sense revolution was, but because we were under a conservative government for 44 years. So how did that common sense revolution sway people? Well, I should say uh, at the outset that there's a lot of cross-pollination going on. So uh, I I was part of the group that was, was trying to get us more aligned to trends in other provinces. So I, I made sure that uh, Ralph Klein and Mike Harris met each other. I made sure that uh, Preston Manning and Mike Harris knew one another and that Preston Manning made the fateful decision not to enter provincial politics to stay in the federal field, which gave us, uh, you know, everything right of center uh, to to ourselves rather than to split that vote with the Reform Party of Ontario, let's say. Yeah. So that was a fateful decision. I was a big part of that. And that that uh, really was helpful. And Ralph Klein gave a lot of good advice to Mike Harris, uh, including uh, the phrase, don't blink when you when you get into power. Do what do what you say you're going to do. Don't try to to then temper it or to to step away from it. Don't blink. Do what you say you're going to do. And he, Mike Harris, really internalized that from Ralph Klein. They they had a very strong friendship even before Mike Harris got elected. So it was a common sense revolution that was kind of modeled on the 
the uh, Newt Gingrich and the contract with America in the 94 election, maybe. Uh, but the idea was here, you know, here in a, in a 30 page booklet is what we're going to do. And we're going to say what we're going to do. We're going to cut taxes. We're going to we had the highest welfare uh, payments in the whole country. Uh, and we said, you know what? We, do, we don't need welfare payments that are so high that they're the highest in the country. We're going to dial it back to 10 percent higher than everyone else. But, you know, not not crazy high uh, work for welfare, those kinds of things. And uh, that resonated with people because uh, people were, were trying to get ahead. The taxes were there were 22 tax hikes under the NDP under Bob Ray. And so a low tax pair government down message at the time was very saleable. And Mike Harris was the salesman. We, we completely got him to be himself. We had this slogan, Hoag, H-O-A-G, hell of a guy. And, you know, Mike Harris would do things to show, oh, he's a hell of a guy. He's not going to eat babies for breakfast. He's a hell of a guy. So, you know, a lot of these things were done simultaneously. And we had the great campaign chairmanship with Leslie Noble and Tom Long. They put it all together and it was a winning combination. The thing with Mike Harris and I, I, I lived through uh, the 90s and uh, the Mike Harris era and Ernie Eves and even Dalton McGinty. And then before I moved out here west, um, the thing with Mike Harris, I found if you didn't agree with his policies that were being put forward, you still, like you said, liked him because he was yeah. a personal guy. He told it like it was and he was a straight shooter. He didn't lie to you. He just basically said, this is what we have to do. Well, let me tell you, every political party has its kryptonite. You know, kryptonite, you know, the thing that yep. makes you weaker and you crumple down on the ground. And every party, you know, and in, in the NDP, it's being self-righteous. The liberals, it's arrogance. For the conservatives, it's meanness. Oh, you're mean. You're doing mean things because you, you, you want to be mean to people. Well, that's really not our intent or our or motive, I would say. But if we look like we're being mean, that ain't good. So the idea of hell of a guy was to show Mike Harris as just like everybody else. He's got the same motives. We had a, we had another saying lead with motive, you know, explain p a complex public policy issues later. But what's your motive? Well, my motive is I want your family to get ahead or I, I, I want to make sure that our welfare recipients get skills so they can get a job. That's the motive, right? So, uh, and again, learn that from Ralph Klein as well as from other successful political leaders, and it was very, very helpful to us. Now, uh, did you get into politics to become a cabinet minister? Everyone says no when they're first <laughs> elected, but uh, when you get that call from the uh, premier's chief of staff or the premier himself or herself, you 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 automatically want to say yes. So, when you got into politics, did you say to yourself, "I have"? A, I, I want to be a cabinet minister. I want to be in the center of power. Oh, for sure. I mean, anybody who's saying no, oh, no, no. I just wanted to be in the background. I, I really didn't have any idea, you know. Uh, no, no, of course. I I've talked to, to two politicians who said no, they didn't want to. And when they got the call, they were surprised. Yeah, OK, <laughs> sure. But look, look I, I mean, maybe d people are different. But in my case, uh, I did want to be in cabinet. I did want to to show some leadership uh, in a portfolio and to be part of the center of it. Uh, and I wasn't in cabinet for the first two and a half years uh, when when we were elected. I'm a f former president of the Ontario PC party and all that. Uh, no, I, I, I had to earn my stripes. I had to do a lot of committee work. And it was like uh, at times it was painful because I thought I could do a better job than Joe Schlobotnik, who was in cabinet. But at the same – that's uh, Charlie Brown's barber, by the way, yeah. in case, uh, for, for the kids out there. <laughs> for uh, those but, who don't uh, know Ontario politics, that is not yeah, an yeah. Ontario politician. No, but – Charlie Brown, you know, the cartoon character. Yeah. His barber was Joe Schlavonic. Anyway, I, I thought I could, you know, every backbencher thinks they could do better than a, any cabinet minister who's suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So, yes, I wanted to be in cabinet, but I had to wait my turn, uh, two and a half years of slogging it out, which was good for me because it made me a good riding person. I spent that time in my constituency learning how to serve my community in Brampton's south and then when you're in cabinet you're i think you've got the the right perspective well and and just on that because the the harris government in 1995 they won a majority an overwhelming majority where there was not a lot of 
of uh, returning uh, members to the leg- uh, to the Queen's Park who had political experience. So some people had to be appointed to cabinet uh, without that political experience. So they had to learn how to be a riding guy or girl, and they also had to learn how to be a cabinet minister. So uh, in, to expand on it, do you think those two years helped you become the politician who you were today? Yeah, I do very much so. And uh, again, uh, one of the things I learned to do was every week, uh, every Friday, I would go door knocking in my riding in between elections because what I heard at the door in 1995 was, oh, we only see politicians when you're out for the vote, right? We never see you after that. So I got it in my head that uh, if I door knocked every Friday, a couple hours every Friday, uh, that would be uh, to my political advantage, but I also made me a better politician. I knew what my constituents were feeling and were thinking. And I would go to caucus meetings and to cabinet meetings eventually, because I kept this up even in cabinet, with the knowledge of what was working, what wasn't working, what was a bubble issue, like what was something that was just inside the bubble of Queen's Park, uh, and what was a real issue. And believe me, they, the two were not always the same. So uh, yeah, I, I think those two and a half years of understanding constituency politics was something I, I've kept with me for 25 years of elected politics. Was it what you expected, though? When you first got elected, you you have this idea of what politicians or politics is going to be like. But when you actually get into the actual legislative body, get into that uh, session, is it what you expected? Or was there a learning curve to even yourself, a political uh, sort of uh, educate uh, someone who's watched politics all their life where you've gone to the actual sitting and go, this is not what I expected. This is not how I expected it to go. Uh, parts, uh, yes, and no. Uh, parts of it were what it were expected. I mean, the the uh, being, uh, you know, on, you have to be on all the time. You can, you cannot, uh, ever think you're you know people aren't watching or aren't listening uh that aspect of it but at the same time um the dynamics of being in a caucus are very very special it is uh you know a very special place where you get to say your mind uh and uh having the right relationship with your fellow caucus members you don't really get a sense of that when you're a staffer to be honest with you uh so uh that was different and then having that relationship across the aisle too for me that was that's not important for everybody but for me it was important to have respect across the aisle to have friends across the aisle i dare say uh and also to handle media how do you handle media properly develop uh, an appropriate relationship and for conservatives it's always difficult because you always feel like the media are out to get you i'm sure every politician thinks that anyway but uh conservatives certainly think that so all of those things you you, you, i don't think there's any school for that You, you learn that on the job now, uh, so those two years, the first two years that you're in uh, government, you pass, you get that fateful call saying, hey, we're calling you up to the big leagues now. You're going to become Minister of Transportation. What was that call like? Were you were you dumbfounded? Were you going oh, like, I didn't expect this call? Or were there rumblings in the party saying, OK, we're potentially doing a cabinet shuffle here. We might be looking at you to potentially become uh, to join cabinet. So I had an internal mole. Oh, uh, and the internal mole was the Honorable William G. D- Davis, who was Premier of Ontario from 1971 to 1985, and he was a constituent of mine. I inherited his riding. Well, it was Liberal for a bunch of years, and then it became my riding, Brampton South. And so, uh, after I was elected, you know, I was waiting by the the phone right after being elected in 1995. Uh, and Davis phoned me and said, you're not going to get the call. So stop waiting by your phone. You're not going to be in cabinet. Don't worry. Bide your time. Do a good job. Work really hard. You'll get into cabinet. So, OK, uh, that sucks. But sure, Mr. Davis, whatever you say. And then in October of 1997, I get another call from Bill Davis. You're going to get a call. You're going to be happy with the call. You're you're into the big leagues now and uh, do a good job for us. You know, that kind of thing. So that kind of helped. Uh, It was not completely out of the blue, but uh, I had to replace uh, the great uh, late uh, Al Paladini as transportation minister, uh, who was a larger than life figure in Ontario politics and and business world and so on. So that was uh, that was something that I had to steal myself for. But uh, hey, 
I was I loved being transportation minister. Saying there's a saying everybody falls in love with their first uh, department or ministry because uh, it's the first place you are at. And it was a great it was a great ministry. Uh, it was easy to judge success, which is not always the case in politics. Uh, how many? kilometers of road did you pave today how many truck t- tires did you stop from falling off rigs today there there were clear indicators of success and um, I, I enjoyed doing it it was uh, I got to meet a lot of people a lot of you know truckers and uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, safety folks who believed in safety on the roads uh, I was helping the economy when 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 uh, transportation is working then the economy's working, uh, public transit issues were big issues back then as they are now. So all of these things were, were great uh, for me to learn uh, at transportation. So I, I loved getting that call. And, and during your time in uh, the Harris government and even in the Eves government as well, you you switched portfolios a few times. You went from trans- uh, sorry transportation to environment to municipal affairs and then to health. The one I want to talk about is that municipal affairs one because you got the mm. call of municipal affairs – After the big amalgamation talk across Ontario, where we were going to amalgamate uh, cities and together to make one uh, large government. I'm in favor of that. I think it's the best way to do it, to be honest. How was it to be a minister of uh, municipal affairs when you had cities potentially looking at you saying we didn't like what your government just did to us? Yeah. And so uh, a bit more to the background. I was the minister right after Al Leach, who was the one who amalgamated yeah. the city of, city of Toronto into one municipality. And that was very protests and candlelight vigils and the end of the world as we know it because East York doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you know, all this stuff. Uh, it, it seems so bizarre to think about it now. But in 19, 1997, it was it was huge. So then I become minister and uh, my mandate was to, more amalgamations. So, <laughs> you know, we just got this crap kicking in Toronto. But your job is to get some more done. So I amalgamated Ottawa. I amalgamated Sudbury. I amalgamated Hamilton. Uh, and in Hamilton, it was very – we actually lost an MPP, Tony Skarika, who resigned in protest of our amalgamation of Hamilton, uh, which we, because the uh, the outskirts didn't want to be in the same – uh, council as downtown Hamilton. They that was you know Stony Creek didn't want to be in the same municipality as Hamilton, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Same with Canada and the PN and Ottawa. But I got I got the legislation done uh, in Ottawa. I, I appointed the late uh, Claude Bennett to be the transition guy to get it done smoothly to find the savings in Ottawa so that it would work for the taxpayers, keep the tax base low as possible, but keep the services up. Uh, and Sudbury, was, uh, there, there was no issue there. But after I did all that, the next guy who replaced me, uh, Chris Hodgson, uh, Harris said, okay, we, that, that's enough of this amalgamation <laughs> stuff, man. We've, we've got so many scars on this. Uh, it's done. So he had a bit of an easier time being municipal minister as a result. Would you do it again? What, the amalgamation? Yeah, because yeah. You, people look back on it and say, okay, yes, we might have overreacted to the initial thought. But we look at it now and say, it's actually working. Yeah, but here's the thing that didn't work. So the idea, Harris's idea was when you amalgamate municipalities, you'll find savings because they'll, it's just, you know, it's bigger and therefore it can get better prices for things. But what we didn't count on or or it wasn't evident at the time was when you amalgamated different municipalities, then you got to negotiate with the unions because this union is getting X dollars, this union is getting X plus $2.50. Uh, and when you amalgamate them, guess what happens? Yeah. It grosses up to the highest, it doesn't gross down, it doesn't go down to the lowest level, it goes up to the highest level. So now everybody's pay, paying X plus $2.50. Uh, and so the costs are higher. So any savings you got from bureaucrats amalgamating and all this, none of it, uh, amounted to much because of those extra costs when you grossed up the wages. So, um, yeah, in that sense, it was not the cost and efficiency exercise that was originally contemplated. I, I always forget that it, because in Alberta, I'm a gov- I was a government employee until I started my business that 
uh, Ontario, some uh, some municipalities are unionized for their workers, where in Alberta, that's just not the case. So, oh, I see. I, I well, always find it interesting. No, I always forget that it is the case. It is the case <laughs> in Ontario. I can assure you of that. Yeah. Um. So, the one. Uh, of course, uh, I, I've watched interviews with you with everything going on in the world. And the one area that people like to talk about is health. Uh, you were appointed uh, health minister and long term care minister under Mike Harris and then reappointed under Ernie Eves. Um, usually when you think of conservatives, you don't think they're going to do well with health. It's just it's not one of those things that people uh, identify with. With economy, yes, health. Usually it's a liberal or an NDP portfolio that does well. But under you, you had SARS. You were able to uh, work and build a, a hospital in Brampton. How did you... How did you connect with the frontline workers, the actual hospital staff, while you were Minister of Health? Yeah, I mean, we did a bunch of things, a uh, uh, bunch of things together that were really important. You mentioned a couple of them. I created a brand new uh, uh, medical uh, medical school in northern Ontario. Uh, we cr- we launched the telehealth uh, uh, advisory system where you can get a, a nurse on, on the line rather than going to emerge. All these things, uh, we, we started the reform of primary care. Uh, for general practitioners, etc. So um, I think all of that helped. That we were we were actually trying to do some some real reforms, but not these were not cost cutting reforms. They were they were better service to the front line kind of reforms, if I can put it that way. So I think that that did help. Uh, when SARS came along. Um, you know, I I made sure that everybody was looked after as best as I could. Uh, I guaranteed their their wages, even if they couldn't get to their patients because everything was geared towards the SARS patients, as an example. Yeah. Uh, nurses, uh, you know, uh, it was always fraught, but I was there for the nurses, uh, I felt, uh, you know, when they needed PPE or, or, or uh, help. And, um, uh, you know, the hospital presidents who were the, you know, the SARS was mostly a hospital-based infection, although it did get out into the general population. It was, it was tougher to get than COVID. So uh, it was more in a hospital setting where you've had comorbidities where uh, the, the people were most at risk, let's put it that way. So I, I, I was there for the hospitals as well. So uh, I, I believe that the combination of being a reformer in a system that needed some reform, some patient-centered reform, uh, and, um, and uh, having... You know, that kind of relationship and that kind of empathy was very, very helpful during stars for sure. After the initial outbreak and uh, things were not winding down, but we had a grasp on SARS, you decided to take a tour of the world and say, Toronto's open for business because you had to do that because, A, the World Health Organization still hadn't lift any, lifted any restrictions of traveling to Toronto, but you went out and actually traveled and got them to lift that restriction. With COVID going on right now, and it's a world pandemic, you can't do that. So how, looking at what's going on right now compared to how you had to handle SARS, what can we do to make sure once we're done this uh, initial hump and we flatten the curve of COVID to say we're open for business and people can start traveling again? Yeah, uh, let me uh, – I, I got to give you one story from that because – uh, there was only two places in the world that had a travel advisory during SARS. It was uh, Hong Kong and Toronto. And uh, when the WHO slapped the travel advisory, that's basically a travel ban yeah. uh, on Toronto. It meant, oh, su- such economic devastation. I mean, things were devastating already. I mean, you could shoot a cannon through the streets of Toronto, not unlike the COVID situation. But it was so – nobody, nobody had dealt with that before. And uh, so it was. It was. Uh, it was new. So um, uh, the combination of that happening and just it felt so unfair that the the travel ban was happening because we actually had wrestled SARS to the ground at that point. So I flew over to meet with Gro Brundtland, the former Nor- Norwegian prime minister who was now who was then the director general of the WHO. To, to convince her otherwise. And I knew she was Norwegian. I knew I wanted to know more about this woman before I got there. So who do I know who's Norwegian? 
And the only th- person I could think of at, uh, who was Norwegian that I could consult was Johan Koss. <laughs> and Johan Koss was Belinda Stronach's husband at the time. And he was a former Olympic speed skater from Norway. So I phoned him. And I said, Johan, you got to tell me about this girl, Brindlin. What, what should I know? Uh, you know, what, what, what is the way, the best way to talk to her? So he gave me a bunch of instructions on, you know, what she was all about. And she said, above all else, Johan said, don't bring in your mobile phone. I said, oh, oh, okay, why? Because she believes that the waves from, the radio waves from a mobile phone will melt your brain. So whatever you do, don't bring in your mobile phone. So anyway, we fly to Geneva. Like I've got this entourage of the chief public health officer and my chief of staff, and I say, "Okay, guys, you gotta you gotta keep the phones in the in the in the embassy. We we ain't bringing the phones in, uh, you know, because I don't want one of them to be ringing, sounding off in the middle of this meeting." Uh, anyway, just a, just a little anecdote of the things you got to do to get ready for meetings sometimes. But we were successful. We got it reversed, and uh, it made a, a big impression on people that I had done that. Here, uh, you know, fast forward to here. What is the future of the travel and transportation and tourism uh, sector? I don't know. I mean, um, there's w- one part of it is, uh, you know, the right procedures, physical distancing, clean, 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 all those things. Uh, airplanes are going to be, you know, one quarter full, if that, these kinds of things. But the second question is, who's going to want to travel? I mean, you know, is are we until you get a vaccine that has been disseminated and goodness knows whether we'll ever get a vaccine. I know. Every, oh, it's going to be the fall. It's going to be the spring. We may never get a vaccine. Uh, SARS is news. And that's a coronavirus. So I know everybody is hoping on a vaccine, but I, I hate to be the skunk in the garden party, but we may never get a vaccine. I'm just saying. So all of these things that we're going to be doing in restaurants, in tourist areas, uh, for sports events and on planes are going to be very disruptive. And how are they going to be? How can they possibly be profitable? You know, airlines got profitability by packing us in like sardines. uh, And uh, that's not going to be possible anymore. So the whole structure of society uh, likely for at least a year, possibly longer, is uh, in many areas going to be severely disrupted. Uh, so that's a long way of saying I don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be tough. And I agree wholeheartedly on that one. So I just wanted to ask that question while we were talking about health. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so we will go back to Ontario politics here for a second. So that 20, 2003 election, that 23, oh, 2003 provincial election, did you did the Eves government at the time because there was a leadership race and he won? Did the Eves government at the time know that they were going into a battle that could potentially result in their loss? Or with everything else that was going on during that time, because I can remember that election where a the there was a massive blackout in yeah. almost all August. <laughs> yep, and then you went to the polls. So did you have an idea that this could potentially go our way, or was it going okay? The liberals might potentially have this one. Well, hope springs eternal. Uh, that's what that's what uh, every politician lives or dies by. <laughs> yep. Uh, so uh, no, I thought we had a genuine chance of winning, uh, and uh, I remember uh, that was forlorn. That that wasn't realistic, to be honest with you. People were tired of us, and uh, they they wanted they wanted change, and that's what Dalton McGinty, the liberal leader, uh, you know, he represented that. And I remember talking to the campaign manager, the the, the provincial campaign manager. Manager Jamie Watt. Now I, I phoned him up. Jamie, you know, uh, here's what I'm hearing at the door. Here's what we've got to do. Uh, you know, this debate coming up is going to be really important for Ernie. And Jamie said to me, Tony, we're going to lose. And this was like week two of the campaign. Wow. I said, What? He said, Tony, we're going to lose. Uh, are you are you traveling to other ridings to help other candidates? I said, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. He says, cancel all those. Try to save your riding. It's every man for himself. Uh, you know, we're going to lose. Uh, so and we can't help you. So you got to you got to do everything you can to help yourself. And this is like week two of the campaign. And I, I was completely thunderstruck. Uh, he was actually accurate and correct. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's that's how 
that's how bad it was that the campaign manager was saying that in, in week two of the campaign. So the analogy, and I just want to get from a person who's been on both sides of winning in government and being defeated, uh, um, the analogy that I often hear is governments are not elected. Governments are defeated. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's mostly true. I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Uh, you've got to be in opposition. You've got to pass the, the sniff test uh, so that if they want to throw the bums out, they feel comfortable with you. And then, then it can happen. But uh, it, it won't happen at all until they get tired of what's there. But even if, even if they're tired of what's there, they might stick with the devil they know if you don't offer a better solution. So it's it, it starts with what you said, but that's not the complete solution for uh, an opposition party to become government. Or even a third party in the case of Mike Harris, right? Where, even a third party, even more so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you were defeated in that election. You take yeah. some time off and then you decide to jump into the federal ring. Uh, the class of Mike Harris, as they said, when you guys were all first elected, you, John Baer, Jim Flaherty, all moved off to federal politics. Um, that decision to run uh, federally, because you ran once, you were defeated, and then you ran again, uh, and then you were elected in Perry Sound, Muskoka. Right. When you decided to do that, were you, again, expecting a cabinet position or were you just saying, OK, you know what? I want to continue to give back because I still feel like there's something in me that I can still give back to. So uh, you forgot one important point. I ran against Stephen Harper for the leadership of the Conservative <laughs> yes. Party of Canada uh, before all of that, like uh, in 2003 and 2004, March 2004. Kicking myself for not remembering election. that now. Yeah, yeah. Against, uh, my, Belinda Stronic and I ran against him. There was only three of us in the race. And uh, so – and then I – so lost, obviously, and, uh, but I ran in the 04 election in Brampton uh, right after that. That March was when the leadership was, and May was when the election was. Because Martin at the not, time called it because he expected yeah. that they weren't fully unified and they could potentially win a majority, which ended yes. up not being a majority. Not being a majority, so that gave Harper a lease on life to try again. Uh, and so I'd given it up. I'd given up. Uh, when I lost in 2004 in Brampton federally, I thought, OK, eh, enough of this running for stuff thing. Uh, I want to take take a break, maybe 10 years. Maybe I'll come back to it. But I knew enough about people I'd observed. It's very difficult to come back. Very difficult. Some people have done it. Jean Chrétien did it as an example very successfully. Uh, Peter McKay's trying to do it. Not so easy to come back. Yeah. So I but I thought, you know, this is it for now. Then I get this call, right, I swear to God, right out of the blue, from the president of the Electoral District Association for the Conservatives in Perry, San Muskoka. Tony, we want you to run here next election. I said, uh, did you not just see the results? I got my ass handed to me in Brampton, and I just lost a leadership. No, no, you're the right guy. You're the guy who can beat the liberal incumbent. The liberal incumbent was the minister of agriculture under Martin. You're the guy who can do it. I had a cottage in Muskoka at the time. And uh, I thought about it. And I started – I did some research, you know. I, well, you know, if if I can win two out of the four major towns and if we can get the same voter turnout uh, on this election, in the next election, and if, 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 you know, you, you can actually – you could actually win this riding. It, you know, it was provincially a conservative riding that had a history. There was a former member of parliament, Stan Darling, who is a conservative. He'd been there for 21 years. When he retired, that's when the liberal got in. For 30, He was 13 years in power. And I just could – we could all sense – people wanted change from the liberals federally now. Yeah. So I was on the other side of the coin. I thought, you know what? I just might do this. I'll, I'll run for the. I had to run for the nomination. There were two other candidates, so I had to win a nomination, fair and square. And um, I went in, and no one, quite frankly, I mean, everybody says, "Oh, you know, Clement, uh, he he only won by twenty eight votes because I won by zero point zero one percent." But no one expected me actually to win. It was a it was a liberal seat, the liberal cabinet minister. But I I won because we worked darn hard, and because Harper had the campaign of his life in, in 2006, uh, going from uh, opposition to a minority 
government. So in answer to your question, I wasn't thinking of cabinet, my friend. I was just trying to get I was just trying to get into parliament and get a win in the win column uh, after a couple of losses. So in that uh, election, no, I, I I remember that election quite well because the, it was it was the split election. There was a part of the election in December, part of it in De- uh, yeah. January, and the beginning of it, it looked like the Liberals might win a mi- minority again. And then right after Christmas, that break sort of just the Liberal Party just collapsed somehow. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, like you said, Harper just basically the then pri- or then leader of the opposition basically just picked it up and just went, I'm going to just walk across the finish line with this you know and he had a really good campaign uh and really focused on some important issues uh including health care uh and uh he uh there were a couple of things that happened there was that rcmp investigation involving ralph goodale the gomery inquiry the, the gomery thing there was a shooting in downtown toronto where a young lady was killed and just a random shooting event that got people concerned about crime in our cities there's all these things you just add them together and uh, they really had an impact on the psyche of people and uh, again change man it, you know it was 13 years it really was time for a change so uh, you you get the call that you you've won by 28 votes and now the prime minister elect wants to appoint you to cabinet minister uh, cabinet minister minister of health yet again well, a portfolio I had a recount I had a I mean, uh, let's unpack it a little bit. I won on election night by 21 votes. Yep. There was an automatic judicial recount where a, a judge is going through every single ballot, not just the contested ballots. And so Harper had to, I learned later, had to defer starting to call people for cabinet. He wanted me in his cabinet, but he didn't want to make the calls until he knew whether I had been elected or not. So that took about three or four days. I finally get votes not 21 and then I'm, I'm i'm at this ontario science center with my godchild going to some exhibit somewhere in the on the ontario science center in toronto and uh, i get the call while we're looking at exhibits at the ontario science center that uh that uh, stephen harper wanted me in his cabinet so uh that was pretty that was pretty sweet and and were you were you happy with the choice that he gave you? Because yet again, um, health care and because one of the things that happened in that le- election was Paul Martin tried to paint Stephen Harper as the guy who would take away the, your health care. He would try to privatize it. And then when you got into power uh, and Stephen Harper got into power as prime minister and you as minister of health, you sort of just followed through with what the liberals had already promised. Well, we had a big promise in the election, which was the patient wait time guarantee. Yeah. So part, and that was one of the top three promises we made uh, in the election. So Harper called me and said, "Look, you know, I, I'm just asking people who've done stuff before to do stuff again." So Flaherty's going to be finance minister. He was finance minister uh, in Ontario, and you you've got to be health minister. And Vic Taves, who is justice minister in Manitoba, he's going to be just you know, and you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. And so. Uh, it made sense. He wanted people with experience, uh, you know, uh, to be uh, to be uh, in positions of authority. Uh, it was not my first choice. I'll be honest with you. Uh, but hey, I'm at the cabinet table with a, a serious position because uh, it was one of our top three promises in the campaign. So uh, I, I was very delighted to be there. And I was very honored to be there. Looking back on your tenure as Minister of uh, the fine, uh, Health, uh, sorry, Health Industry, and then the President of the Treasury Board, w- what was that like to serve under Stephen Harper? I loved it. It was the thrill of a lifetime. Um, he was an amazing Prime Minister, uh, and uh, very, very thoughtful knew it, the files, knew the issues and the policies frontwards and backwards. You did not show up to cabinet unless you knew your stuff. And we were there to decide things. And one of the knocks of the Paul Martin government was that they talked about issues and they talked about issues and they talked and talked and talked and they never actually got to the decision point. Uh, and uh, Harper was determined not to be like that. And so he was, we were there in cabinet to make decisions. And it was very collaborative. I know this doesn't, I mean, I, no, are you kidding? He was a dictator. You know, <laughs> Harper was a dictator. But no, actually, it was very collaborative. Uh, he sought 
and received a lot of advice, uh, including from the caucus, uh, as well as the cabinet. And uh, it made for a great collaborative process where we could do our best and be our best. And uh, I'll never, uh, you know, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh, I I can't thank him enough for being part of that. That uh, 2011 election, when you finally won that coveted majority, mm-hmm. um, was there a different attitude that the uh, the government had at that point? Because usually when you win a majority, you're like, oh, I can do whatever we want now. Or was there still uh, that collabor- uh, collaborative approach where, hey, what does the, what do the NDP want? What are you guys looking for and how can we help? Or was it more let's 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 do what we actually were here to govern for and what we campaigned on? Yeah, I think there was some of that. I'll, I'll uh, grant you that. Uh, certainly, uh, we felt that some of the constraints of minority parliaments were, were no longer on us uh, and that we could uh, go to our agenda. Uh, and I was given president of the Treasury Board with the mandate to get us to a balanced budget, which meant some tough decisions. I, I reviewed over six. 150 programs uh, as part of that exercise called DRAP, uh, Deficit Deficit Reduction Action Plan. It became a verb. I've been drapped. You know, <laughs> only in Ottawa, right? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the fact is it was we had to make some tough decisions. And the other thing that was interesting about that election, which was a prelude to the times in which we find ourselves, is uh, immediately upon our election, there were efforts – by our opponents to delegitimize that election. So you had the, uh, you know, the, the the controversy or the scandal over, uh, you know, the, uh, the the phone calls. The robocalls. Uh, the robocalls scandal. And then uh, I think we're doing the speech from the throne in the Senate chamber. And one of the... Um, uh, Sen- Sen- the in- yeah, stop Harper sign. Remember that? Yep. So that is all about delegitimizing the elected government, you know, which is what opposition parties do. Don't get me wrong. But this took it to another level because all of a sudden we had social media, which was just coming into the fore. Twitter was I think I got on Twitter in 2010. This was 2011 uh, and uh, Facebook and so on. So it it had traction. Uh, And of course, now it doesn't matter whether it's liberal or conservative or Democrat or Republican. the, The losers always try to delegitimize the winner. And Jason Kenney, same deal. How do we delegitimize Jason Kenney's mandate in Alberta? It's, it's hap- it happens every election cycle. Now, that, that to me was the first time I saw that happen. Uh, and, uh, and Nigel Wright was the uh, chief of staff to Prime Minister Harper. And we, he and I talked about this, how you know, we got to do everything we can to maintain our legitimacy as a government. Because if our opponents had their way, we'd be, we'd be dele- delegitimized. Uh, we don't have a right to be there. Right. So uh, it's a very interesting turn of political culture that is now part and parcel of what happens every every election cycle now. Now, you talked about social media. You were an early adopter of social media and you're you you use Twitter uh, a lot and you you basically reach out to anyone who sends you. Hence why we're doing this interview. Um, Yeah. So what, what was it about that social media where you were able to engage with residents that you thought, okay, this is this is the next step in uh, politics of getting out there and actually connecting with people this way? Well, it started at a time when we were all so innocent, though, weren't we? In 2010, <laughs> Twitter, well, what could possibly go wrong? Oh. Everybody's going to everybody's going to be nice to one another on Twitter, I'm sure. Oh, totally. Uh, everybody's everybody's going to give one each other the benefit of the doubt. Of course, back then, 10 years ago, that's how you felt. Uh, not so much now. But uh, at the time, uh, it was uh, the great reducer of barriers. All of a sudden, there was no barrier between the elected and the electors. You could have this direct conversation or with anybody in, on the planet. Uh, and uh, I found that uh, great and intriguing. And, uh, you know, well, let's let's have this conversation. Let, I became a real advocate for a digital democracy. And when I was president of the Treasury Board, I made sure that we pumped out all this, uh, all the data of the government uh, through uh, open data policy that we were pursuing. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I thought there was great potential. 
uh, you know, how the worm has turned, you know, uh, around the world we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the, these color revolutions in, in uh, the Middle East and in Georgia and in Ukraine, these orange revolution and, and blue revolution and all these uh, people power uh, uh, ways to try to get the tyrant out, all fueled by social media platforms. That was the great hope, more democracy, more accountability, more transparency. Now, of course, uh, the Internet writ large and social media and so on is used as a tool of oppression by authoritarians. Uh, and we're into the surveillance state in many of these countries, and uh, we're into troll farms <laughs> by uh, evil governments uh, that are uh, seeking to dismantle our democracy. It's a very different, and it's we're into the dark mirror world uh, of uh, 2020 versus when it started out in 2010 for me and for many others. The uh, 2015 election. Um it was. It did not go your way. It did not go anyone's way because people were not expecting that uh, that election result. Um, what happened in that campaign for the conservatives? Oh, it was a terrible campaign. Terrible campaign. Uh, uh, really, uh, no focus. Um, you know, make fun of Justin Trudeau because he's got nice hair. Uh, no real social media campaign. The advertising was terrible. The training was horrible. Candidate search was bad. Uh, need I go on? Well, uh, there was a, a lot going. There was a lot that should have been better, and so we didn't put our best foot forward. I really don't think Harper's heart was in it. Yeah, he would have taken another mandate if the the public had bestowed that on him. But you got to have the fire in your belly, uh, and uh, I don't think it was there. To be honest with you, um, so. You, you talked about that candidate search, and that was not just the conservatives. It was liberals, NDP, and conservatives, and Green, who all had scandals for candidates throughout that election. Um, going into that opposition role, because being in power for almost uh, 10 years, you now are in opposition on the opposition benches. Was it a change of uh, – was was there a bit of a sense of uh, insecurity that – we, we weren't able to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish in that those times that we had. And now we are seeing this person that we've tried to uh, reject and get the Canadian people to reject now taking up the mantle of government and with a majority that we've coveted for so long and they got it on their first try. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it that way. Here's the way I'd put it, though. Um, I think that we we appreciated we had 10 years in power nearly 10 years. And for conservatives, that doesn't happen very often nationally. So uh, we were very lucky, quite frankly, to have 10 years in power. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is uh, for 80 percent of the time in national governments, it's not conservatives who are in power. It's the, it's the liberals. So uh, we had a good run and then the run came to an end. And uh, then Harper rode off into the, into the sunset uh, after accomplishing a great deal. Now we're in opposition. And it's a frustrating place to be because the the first of all the liberals would grind it into your nose that you're into the grind your nose into it that you're the opposition. So uh, they 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 did lots of stuff. Just you know, uh, it, they weren't because, playing nice. Yeah, I mean, and and I get that from one level, but on another level, they did a lot of stuff just cause, to do the opposite of what we did, uh, okay. which led to very bad public policy in a lot of areas. So, uh, you know, uh, it meant they were a lot closer to China than they should have been, uh, as an example. Uh, and uh, they uh, they they did stu- they totally revamped uh, the child uh, the child credit. Uh, you know, just to show that it was better than the one that we did, uh, and uh, the deficits for the sake of deficits, this this kind of stuff. But hey, they won, we lost. They they get the they get the corner offices, we don't. Um, but it it is frustrating, especially for the new. A third of our caucus was brand new. Uh, Thirty three out of the ninety nine were new to Parliament, and they were bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and full of vim and vigor and uh, and all of that, and that, which was great. Uh, but for those of us who had tasted power and uh, enjoyed making decisions uh, for the public benefit, it was uh, it was a different it was it was a different road to hope for sure. 
Now, being a political observer outside of politics, because you you decided to step down from politics in 2019, being that political observer during that election, was it was it a little hard to watch as some people were making decisions that you might not fully agree with when it comes to the Conservative Party? Yeah, <laughs> I was still I was still active, though. I was campaigning on, on behalf of my local candidate who won. And I went into three or four other, maybe four or five different ridings in Ontario to help out some friends who were running. So I felt like I knew what was going on on the ground, at least in Ontario. Um, but uh, it was a frustrating campaign. Uh, a lot of rookie errors and, uh, again, bad communications. And um, uh, it, it was it was tough. And uh I can say that knowing that my view of that was not the only person to have that view because there was a lot of frustration that brewed after the election uh, that only got worse as the as the uh, the fact that we had done so well in Western Canada, but you know we, we faced this red wall uh, at the Manitoba Ontario border. Very frustrating to be on the other side of that wall. And so uh, uh, that's what fueled the reaction inside the party after that uh, after that election loss. So what does the Conservative Party have to do today to win in 20 whatever the next election date will be? Mm-hmm. Well, we got to elect a new leader. For, <laughs> we're doing that. <laughs> do you have a horse in the race already? Yeah, I'm, I'm backing Aaron O'Toole. OK, uh, so I'm, I'm helping him out a little bit. Uh, but uh, regardless, uh, whether Aaron makes it or not. Uh, the fact is we've got to come up with uh, uh, a different way to communicate. Uh, we've got to communicate to millennials a lot better than we do because they're the uh, biggest chunk of the electorate. And we failed two elections in a row to do that. Uh, we've got to talk about environmental issues better. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to talk to urban dwellers in a way that uh, is is better and yet that's all stuff that I would have said three months ago now we're into the post COVID there's the there's the BC and the PC before COVID that's the <laughs> that was my answer to your question now we're into post COVID or during COVID we've got the biggest depression that has ever befallen us and I'm not even, not even talking about in memory I'm talking in history in the UK, they're talking about the biggest depression since 1702. Yeah. And the only thing, I mean, people are losing their jobs left, right, and center. Uh, bankruptcies are starting. Uh, debt is unmanageable. Um, that's even while we're in the COVID. You know, uh, it's not going to get so much better after COVID if there is an after COVID. Uh, that it'll erase all that. In Alberta, you've got additional challenges, obviously, with the oil patch. So, so uh, I don't know. I mean, you're, it's different politics now. And, you know, that was the other thing I was feeling in 2015 and beyond. It's different now. It, it was different from when I started. And I was trying to adapt with, with that. But it, it's tough when, you, when you've honed your skills in one era and you are so obviously in a different era. Uh, and uh, so I'm glad I'm observing rather than participating. Although I'm participating in politics, I'm just not seeking elected office. But uh, post-COVID, uh, we can have this discussion. It's a great discussion to have, but it's it's going to be very different uh, politics as well as economics in, in just a few weeks' time. Well, even just on that comment of people coming back to, into politics after a 10- or 5-year gap, five years is a long time in politics, and things have changed. The people that you rely on for constituent work might not be there. The residents that you knew have potentially moved away, potentially passed away, potentially not even there or supporting somebody else now. So um, looking at the people who are getting back into politics, and I'm not I'm just saying Peter, Peter McKay, because he's the prominent one that's coming back into politics. Right. It's hard for them to potentially engage with voters now because you're so used to doing it one way. And now in post COVID or at during COVID times, it's completely different now. Yeah, well, I mean, all these Zoom meetings that are, have been going on in the leadership race. Yeah. Because uh, you, know, you can't have town hall meetings in person or uh, meet and greets. Uh, so all of the candidates have been doing Zooms 
uh, or teleconferencing, not to give Zoom uh, free uh, advertising. They don't need it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but you, you see what I'm saying? Like, it, it's just a different kind of politicking going on now already. Uh, and uh, there's not going to be a leadership convention at all. We're just going to be mailing in our ballots. So that's going to be different. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, you adapt or die. Uh, that's true in life. It's true in politics. And uh, the, the, the winner is going to be able, the most adaptable. And then he's going to adapt again. Uh, or she, because there's one female in the race, they're going to have to adapt again uh, to take on Justin Trudeau. Now, here's the good news. Justin Trudeau is old in the tooth now. He came from an era, uh, early millennial era. Uh, it's a different era all of a sudden now for Justin Trudeau if he chooses to run again. Ooh, let's start that rumor. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, he's he's... He's got to adapt, and he's probably feeling the pressure and feeling disoriented by the politics of today versus the politics of yesterday. So very interesting time. So the last area I want to talk about is your new adventure. It just launched yeah. last year is your podcast. First off, I, I knew Jody Jenkins when I lived in Belleville. So uh, when I saw that you two were together, I first my first initial question was, how did these two get together? <laughs> Yeah, well, I knew him when he was a candidate yep. um, in 2015, and we kept up our friendship, and uh, he's a golfer, I'm a golfer, so we, we would golf once a year for sure. And then uh, uh, then after I made my decision not to run again, he approached me and said, you know, we got to do a podcast. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I, I knew about podcasting, obviously. It was, uh, you know, the next big thing. And I said, but I don't. I don't, I don't know. What do you, what, you want to do it together? Is that what you're saying? He said, yeah. So I thought, well, this is an easy way to get into it with somebody I like and, and respect. And we've got a good rapport. So one of my media interests is the podcast and another thing podcast uh, available on Spotify, Apple, Google, you name it, iHeartRadio. Uh, and we talk about you know, news and views, politics, pop culture, I, music, because I'm a big music guy. I've got another show on a local Muskoka, Muskoka radio station called Hunters Bay Radio, uh, uh, Tony's Rock and Shindig. So I'm a DJ, bring back the old the old, uh, the old uh, classics and some new songs too and play them and talk about them. And then I've got a show called Boom and Bust with Tony Clement on the newsforum.ca, which is a, a new um, a new news site. And that's a that's a business and economics program because I didn't want to do politics all the time. I wanted to get to do other things. So it's more of a business show rather than a political show, although politics is everywhere. <laughs> Have you enjoyed uh, so it so far? Yeah, I love having a media empire per se, uh, and it doesn't pay any of the bills. But uh, I'm uh, I'm doing some other stuff uh, in, as an entrepreneur, which I've always wanted to get back into. And I've got a couple of startups I'm working with and uh, doing some international consulting and that that kind of thing too. So and my last I'm, question, I'm happy. and my last question before I have to let you go here is where did your where where did your uh, love of music come from? Because you I, I see the four guitars sitting behind you right now. Yeah, it's yeah. perfectly displayed for the viewers on not podcasts but okay. <laughs> where did your where did your love for music come from so i've always uh, i mean i think music the soundtrack of our lives lives blah 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 but um when i turned 50 which is nine years ago i'd always wanted to play guitar i'd never never picked up a guitar and i thought you know what if i don't start now it'll never happen so it became my project to play guitar and uh I just learned off YouTube. I mean, that's believe me. I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to be uh, in the leagues of Eddie Eddie Van Halen anytime soon. But you know, basic chords and some bar chords and some power chords and blah blah blah. Before you know it, you can play rock and roll songs. And so I, I started that way. And then then some guys I know locally here said, "Hey, we got a bit of a garage band. Why don't you be part of the garage band?" So we we became a band and we've got six players in the band we call it we call ourselves the doc spiders because that's a local it's a local reference to a very nasty spider that lives in our under our docks in muskoka and um we started to do gigs uh and i loved it i i love performing uh that way uh and i love having a bunch of 
more accomplished musicians around me so I don't sound as crappy. Uh, and uh, I just have fun with it, man. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy music. I enjoy learning about music. Uh, and uh, I feel part of a of a really important group. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a part of my life now, and I, I really enjoy it. Well, that's awesome. Uh, Tony, I want to thank you very much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, yeah. So uh, just to make sure, it's uh, uh, and another podcast. And another thing. And another and thing. Another so <laughs> not podcast, and another yeah. podcast. And another thing podcast. Yeah. Much appreciated. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks very much. Once again, I want to thank the Honorable Tony Clement for appearing as our final guest of the season. I want to take this moment and thank the amazing guests who've all agreed to sit down and chat about their story and their life. We've had 44 great episodes of the show, five weeks of special series, which adds up to 66 great conversations with people from all backgrounds. Again, this will be our season finale. We will be back with season two of the Cross Border Interview Podcast in September. We have great episodes with former politicians from across Canada, musicians, and our first week-long series of shows talking to school board trustees. I want to take this moment and thank everyone who has tuned in and listened to the show. Our listeners here in Alberta, across Canada, and yes, even around the world, listeners like you have made the show even better. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. From everyone here at the show. We hope you have a great rest of the summer and stay safe.